On January 16, 1920, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which said that the production, transport, and sale of alcohol was now illegal, prohibition, went into effect. It's not going to have the effect that its supporters really hoped for. In fact, in many ways, it will increase crime. You will see a rise in the number of illegal bars. There will be more of those than the legal ones that were open prior to prohibition. It will bring about the rise of kind of the gangsters that you think of from the 1920s, Al Capone and, and the, the crime in Chicago. All of that will come about because of prohibition. Most people are going to really try to ignore it. They made beer and wine at home. Finding a doctor to sign a prescription for medicinal whiskey sold at drugstores was relatively easy. And there really wasn't a way to really completely stop the sale and transport of alcohol. So finally the realization will come that this has not worked and prohibition will end on December 5th, 1933 when Utah became the 36th state to ratify the 21st Amendment, which is going to repeal Prohibition. Relatively unknown outside of his own state of Ohio, Warren G. Harding was a true dark horse candidate, winning the Republican Party's nomination due to some backroom political dealings by his friends after the nominating convention had become deadlocked. Before receiving the nomination, Harding was asked, whether there were any embarrassing episodes in his past that might be used against him. His formal education was limited, he had a long-standing affair with the wife of an old friend, and he was a social drinker in the time of Prohibition. However, Harding answered no, and the party moved to nominate him, only, discover, only to discover later his relationship with Kerry Fulton Phillips, and this was his best friend's wife and it turned out that there were incriminating letters that he had written to her and the Republican Party chair people, the nominating convention, uh, the party leadership will actually pay her and her husband to go to Europe and stay there during the election so that there won't be any possibility of the Democrats finding out about them and it's kind of exploding in their face before the election. In the 1920 election, Harding ran against Democratic Ohio Governor James M. Cox, whose running mate was Assistant Secretary of the Navy Franklin D. Roosevelt. Harding's front porch campaign during the late summer and fall of 1920 captured the imagination of the country. <coughs> Not only was it the first campaign to be heavily covered by the press and to receive widespread newsreel coverage, but it was also the first modern campaign to use the power of Hollywood and Broadway stars who traveled to Marion, Ohio for photo opportunities with Harding and his wife. The campaign owed a great deal to Florence Harding, who played perhaps a more active role than any previous candidate's wife in a presidential race. She cultivated the relationship between the campaign and the press. She even went so far as to coach her husband on the proper way to wave in newsreel cameras or to the newsreel cameras to make the most of coverage. The campaign also drew upon Harding's popularity with women. Considered handsome, Harding photographed well compared to Cox. However, it was Harding's support for women's suffrage in the Senate that made him extremely popular with women. The ratification of the 19th Amendment in August 1920, which finally gave women the right to vote, brought huge crowds of women to Marion, Ohio to hear Harding. Upon winning the election, Harding appointed many of his old allies to prominent political positions. Known as the Ohio Gang, some of the appointees used their new powers to rob the government. And Harding's government and his presidency is going to be known primarily for the scandals that are going to emerge. And he is really to this day considered to be the worst president that we have had. The most infamous scandal of the time was the Teapot Dome Affair. Elk Hills in California and Teapot Dome in Wyoming were oil fields located on public land reserved for emergency use by the U.S. Navy only when the regular oil supplies diminished. Teapot Dome is located about 50 miles north of Casper, Wyoming. One of the public officials most opposed to the reserves was New Mexico Republican Senator Albert B. Fall. 
His political allies convinced Harding to appoint Fall as U.S. Secretary of the Interior in March 1921. In 1922, the reserves were still under the jurisdiction of Edwin C. Denby, the U.S. Secretary of the Navy. Fall convinced Denby to give jurisdiction over the reserves to the Department of the Interior. Fall then leased the rights of the oil to Harry F. Sinclair of the original Sinclair Oil without competitive bidding. Concurrently, Fall also leased the Naval Oil Reserves at Elk Hills, California to Edward L. Doheny of Pan American Petroleum in exchange for personal loans at no interest. In return for leasing these oil fields, Fall received gifts from the oil men totaling about $400,000. It was his money changing hands that was illegal, not so much the lease itself. Fall attempted to keep his actions secret, but the sudden improvement in his standard of living caused suspicion. The Senate opened an investigation. For two years, the committee investigated while Fall, Fall covered his tracks. The committee leader had his office ransacked. Still, the committee found no evidence of wrongdoing. The leases seemed legal, but records kept disappearing mysteriously. Finally, as the investigation was winding down and, and they were preparing to find Fall innocent, the committee leader uncovered one piece of evidence Fall had forgotten to cover up. Doheny's loan to Fall in November 1921 in the amount of 100000 after Fall was found guilty of bribery in 1919, fined $100,000 and sentenced to one year in prison, he becomes the first presidential cabinet member to go to prison for his actions in office. Harry Sinclair, who refused to cooperate with the government investigation, was charged with contempt, fined $100,000, and received a short sentence for tampering with the jury. Edward Doheny was acquitted in 1930 of attempting to bribe Fall. Charles Miller, head of the Office of Alien Property, was convicted of accepting bribes. These are more of the scandals that comes out of Hardy's administration. Jess Smith, personal aide to the Attorney General, destroyed papers and then committed suicide. Charles Forbes, director of the Veterans Bureau, skimmed profits, earned large amounts of kickbacks, and directed underground alcohol and drug dis distribution. He was convicted of fraud and bribery and drew a two-year sentence. Charles Kramer, an aide to Charles Forbes, also committed suicide. No evidence to date suggests that Harding personally profited from these crimes, but he was apparently unable to stop them. In June 1923, Harding set out on a cross-country voyage of understanding, planning to meet ordinary people and explain his policies. During this trip, he became the first president to visit Alaska. Rumors of corruption in his administration were beginning to circulate in Washington by this time, and Harding was profoundly shocked by a long message he received while in Alaska, apparently detailing illegal activities previously unknown to him. At the end of July, while traveling south from Alaska through British Columbia, he developed what was thought to be a severe case of food poisoning. He gave the final speech of his life to a large crowd at the University of Washington Stadium at the University of Washington campus in Seattle, Washington. The President's train proceeded south to San Francisco. Arriving at the Palace Hotel, he developed pneumonia. Harding died of either a heart attack or a stroke August 2, 1923. He was succeeded by v Vice President Calvin Coolidge, who was sworn in by his father, a Justice of the Peace in Vermont. This was the heyday of the Roaring Twenties, or the Jazz Age. Life expectancy was basically 54 years for both sexes. Average annual earnings was a little about $1,200. It took 13 days to reach California from New York. There were 387,000 miles of paved road. This was a time when some of our greatest writers were at work. Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, and Langston Hughes. Crossword puzzles became popular, as were endurance races of all types. Dance marathons began in 1923 and became the rage. The Charleston was the most popular dance of the era. Harry Houdini was a famous escape artist. The Miss America contest started in 1921 in Atlantic City. This was the flapper age. Uh, for women by 1921, the longer skirt was back, some long and uneven at the bottom. Uh, by 1925, the short skirt was all the rage. And these were the flappers. These were kind of considered modern women wearing this, these uh, sh shorter skirts. This was beginning of the heyday of manufacturing cosmetics and the spread of ready-to-wear fashion. 
cigarettes sold for 10 cents a pack. Automobiles revolutionized the country. You could buy a Ford for $290. They helped to create new jobs, but ended others. They helped to shrink the country and created a need for better roads and a highway system, which will begin under Calvin Coolidge. The radio united the country. The first talking motion picture appeared in 1927, the jazz singer starring Al Jolson. In that same year, the first transatlantic flight occurred. Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly nonstop from the U.S. to Paris by himself, in, and he flew the Spirit of St. Louis, that was the name of his plane, and as a result, he became an international celebrity. Calvin Coolidge will serve one term. He does not run again because his teenage son uh, was one day playing tennis uh, at the White House and stubbed his toe, and an infection set in, and the day before penicillin and other antibiotics, uh, that infection grew worse and he died. And Calvin Coolidge su was suffering from depression as a result of his son's death, so opted not to run again. Herbert Hoover, Republican, will win the 1928 presidential election. And will have the unfortunate luck, if you want to call it that, of being the president when the Great Depression will start and much of the blame for the Depression will be placed on his shoulders.